welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see you all and welcome to Dr. William Willimon as well. Um, uh, so glad to have this time to have a conversation about the book Preacher's Dare. Over the years, uh, Dr. Willimon's books and um, podcasts and uh, YouTube videos have been a great source of help for me in both uh, uh, gaining new insight into particular texts, but also in thinking about um, what does it mean to be um, a leader, um, a worship leader, a preacher, um, a leader of a congregation. And so um, a few months ago now, I guess, uh, he offered to lead a conversation about Preacher's Dare, and um, I took was uh, excited to take him up on that. So, um, and welcome to all of you. Nice to see your faces. Uh, some of you we've not connected for two or three years, so it's nice to, nice to see you again. Um, so while we're uh, well, we're going to have Dr. Willeman talk for a few minutes. Then I'm going to ask some questions to get the conversation started, and um, we want to uh, invite you to put your questions into the chat box at, as we go along, but. Um, there will also be opportunities for you to um, unmute your mic and then ask the questions yourself. So um, at this stage, you you should probably mute your mic, all except for uh, Dr. Willeman, and um, and then um, at the and when there's an opportunity to engage the conversation, uh, we'll have you unmute your mics at that point. So. Um, looking for for you on the uh, on the screen here oh there you are okay <laughs> um welcome again and uh i'll turn it over to you and get started well thank you christine and good to be with you colleagues i've had some great experiences among anglicans in canada um christine has told me a little bit about you and what you're doing and I envision this afternoon as a time to talk shop about what God has gotten us into in calling us to be spokespersons for the gospel and to talk about some of those challenges together. And uh, thank you. It's good to be with you. Oh, for reasons known only to the Lord, uh, preaching is a primary way that God loves us uh, by calling frail, finite human agents like me. Uh, of course, you're not accustomed to hearing the gospel from someone with my accent. Um, and uh, I hope a better voice than mine is today. But, um, and, and I think that there is something at the heart of the Christian faith that calls for proclamation. Paul says up front in Romans, uh, <clears throat> where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing. This, this faith is acoustical. It, it comes through the ear uh, rather than the eye primarily. And um, faith where does faith come from? It comes from someone saying something to us about Jesus and then our hearing that. And uh, I think, you know, maybe it's because the Christian faith is something that must be told to you. As the philosopher Kierkegaard said, the, the Christian faith does not arise from any human heart. There may be faiths that come to you after walks in the woods or sitting quietly in your study or ruminating in your ego. Christianity is not one of those. There's nothing about this faith that is natural, that is common sense, that is normal. It, somebody's got to tell you this faith. In fact, I'm assuming that all of us are here gathered because in some way or another, uh, God used somebody 
to tell us something that we could not tell ourselves, namely the good news. Interestingly, the gospel is called euangelion, good news, uh, by that very designation. It reminds us that this is news. Uh, by the nature of news, is it's something that has to be told to you. It's not something that arises uh, from within you. And um, in other words, we're gathered as those who have heard some good news uh, that is named Jesus Christ. So I'm saying that, therefore, preaching is at the heart of what it means to be Christian. It also means that we are here as those who are appropriately humbled by that, that we've been, we've received something from the hands of another. Somebody had to love God enough and love us enough to tell us the story, to hand over the truth. And that's what God's called us to do as preachers, is to be those who tell the story that people can't tell themselves, to tell a story, the good news, that is by its nature countercultural. It is counter to a lot of the stories the world tries to lay on us. Uh, it is, I used to say when I was a college chaplain, uh, <laughs> maybe when some student would come out after one of my sermons and say, I've never heard anything like this before. Uh, uh, where did you get all this? And I would respond, uh, where would you have heard this? <laughs> Watching television, surfing the web, sitting in a Duke University classroom, no, you had to get dressed and come down here at an inconvenient time of the week to hear news like this, because in a sense, there are powerful forces at work keeping this news from getting through to you. So uh, that's our job. Uh, here's a definition of preaching that I talk about in the book, but that I think preaching uh, occurs when the preacher stands up on Sunday and uh, joins a conversation that God has been having with God's people all week long. And then in your sermon, you contribute to that conversation by telling them what you've heard from the word, uh, scripture. Uh, you contribute to that conversation and then you continue that conversation for the rest of the week. One of the great privileges that you and I enjoy in being pastors of people, priests to them, is that we, uh, we're, we're part of a conversation that goes on before you get into the pulpit and continues if your sermon works long after you've left the pulpit. Uh, and, and let me, just to put a, a further point on that, uh, here's, here's what I think you do when you're preaching at your most faithful. The, the preacher, uh, in service to the congregation, goes to God's word, scripture, and listens using the best skills that you have to say, all right, Lord, Tell me something. Uh, tell me something we would know <laughs> without you revealing it to us. And, and then you hope to make a discovery. Uh, discoveries are interesting. Uh, what we already know, uh, common sense isn't that interesting. And you go to a biblical text in a way to kind of say, hey, hey, Bible, surprise me. Show me something I hadn't seen before. Give me a unique insight that, that I can share with these people. Uh, the great thing is, if you make a discovery, if God gives you a discovery in your study of the text, you'll find a way to announce that discovery. It's kind of the nature of discoveries that <clears throat> if you get a discovery, you'll find a way to share it uh, with others. And then you simply 
announce your discovery to the congregation. In so doing, you, you kind of take the congregation on the same journey you made when you were encountered by something from scripture. You announce that discovery to the congregation. John Calvin said, sermons are twice born, once in the preacher's study, and then second, uh, born again in the sermon. As you give people the joy of receiving something from the word that they couldn't have known had they not come to church and listened to you preach. And um, that is the vocation we're called to do. And I have become increasingly interested in that how if, if the Christian faith comes to you in great part through preaching, it also means that being a Christian means to be a, a good listener. It, maybe we ought to pray that every time we come to church and prepare to hear a sermon. Uh, Lord, help me to hear what you want to say, even if what you want to say to me is not what I think I'd like to hear from you. Come on, let help me hear. Um, and to be a good preacher, you got to be a good listener. You got to listen to the biblical text. And then you're also busy all listening all week long uh, to the congregational context. And uh, then you stand up and say what you've heard. And it also may imply, too, that to be a Christian, Christian uh, to continue in the way of discipleship is, is training in the art of, of learning how to listen to the God that we didn't expect, uh, whose name uh, is Jesus Christ. Uh, and you, you think of all those times Jesus would say, would begin some parable or you know, not by saying obey or uh, uh, do right, but he would say hear. It's all he asked, just hear a parable. And you remember those times when we listened, but we didn't hear anything. And he said, you understand what I'm talking about? And we said, no. And he said, well, if you got ears to hear, hear. Oh, here's another parable. And maybe our great hope in life in death, in whatever life is beyond life, uh, this life, uh, our, our hope is that our God is loves to talk. Our God loves is is not only God, but loves to tell everybody about it, <laughs> and that's a primary way God loves us is by continuing to reveal God's self to us and God's way to us. Uh, otherwise known as preaching. And that's the job we've been given by God in the church. And so I look forward to talking with you about it. Christine, you've got some uh, questions or insights from uh, looking over my book. I better unmute myself. Yes, I do. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, as you know, as I've mentioned um, in our email conversations, um, most of the participants this afternoon are lay worship leaders in the United Church, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a, a couple of ordered ministers here as well. But uh, as I was was reading the your book, um, I and thinking about who might be here today. I, I um, thought about how often I've heard them say that they are surprised that they have been called into this work. Uh, they're very acutely aware that they aren't trained, seminary trained preachers. Um, some of them have heard from ordered ministers that, you know, the, the ordered ministers think they shouldn't be preaching. Um, and so they, they um, many of them struggle with what authority they have to to be preachers. But as I was reading the book, I, it occurred to me that even ordered ministers have to do that uh, work of struggling as to, okay, what authority do I have to stand up there Sunday by Sunday and, and say, this is the word of the Lord. 
So I, I'd be interested in hearing a bit more, uh, if you could speak to us a bit more about that, um, that struggle, that uh, hmm. work that has to be done. To You know, uh, Christine told me that most of you were lay preachers. I'm not sure what that means in the United Church. Uh, I'm a Methodist, and Methodism, hey, by the way, many of you were Methodists too uh, before <laughs> you all got united. But um, Methodism began as a movement of lay preachers, uh, and John Wesley felt like lay preachers, indistinguished from established church, ordained clergy in the Church of England, uh, the lay preachers were particularly well suited for the proclamation of the gospel. So maybe I'm continuing that tradition and saying to you that uh, I think one, uh, Christine said, some of you are surprised that you uh, have been summoned to this ministry. And I'd say, that's great. That's a sign maybe of an admirable humility before the word. Uh, I, I wish more of my fellow seminary trained ordained clergy felt a little more surprised. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about there? And um, that, and I think it's wonderful for all clergy to feel that wonderful sense of surprise. It who me, <laughs> uh, who me said both to a congregation that summons you to this ministry and to the Lord. Uh, and if you know much of scripture, you know there's a long history of people being summoned and their first response is, who me? Uh, are you sure you got the right person? I'm too young to do this. Uh, I'm too old to do this. I'm too sinful to do whatever. And the Lord usually says, hey, you're going to do this. Uh, this is my idea not yours. Uh, so uh, the surprise, I would also say that one wonderful thing about being a preacher, I, I've once said nothing ever bad has happened to a preacher. Uh, sometimes I'm challenged on that. But by that, I mean, the great thing about being a preacher is the Lord takes whatever you got, including some of the most painful, bad stuff you got, and can weave that into your proclamation. Uh, I got a friend who I asked him, I said, you are such a well-received preacher. Uh, I wonder, what do you think contributed to that? And he said, my second divorce made me a really good preacher. <laughs> said, it's given me a credibility with people. And I thought, isn't that weird that this painful human experience. So um, I would, in fact, I would urge each of you to think to yourself, I wonder what uh, experiences, skills, good and bad, that I have, uh, God is using. Uh, and I, I know I'm, I'm a bishop in the Methodist church, and uh, it was fascinating to see uh, like I'm thinking of a lay preacher I had because uh, in fact in my annual conference in Alabama we had more lay preachers than any other conference in the states uh, but uh, I remember when I noted that a preacher had experienced this marvelous turnaround of a dying church and I said to her uh, what how did this happen and she responded uh, Bishop, <clears throat> I've started four businesses <clears throat> in my day. Uh, three of them failed. I didn't know it, but the Lord was training me to lead a failing congregation. I also, when I uh, complimented another preacher on her leadership ability and her preaching, and she said to me, well, what'd you expect? I I did 15 years as a mid-high principal and teacher. 
And she said, if you can teach a 14 year old male anything, you're good. <laughs> she said, so I, the Lord has trained me. She said, I, I'll just say this. Some of the 50, 60 year olds I'm preaching to are more irresponsible than a lot of the 14 year olds I work with. And my 14 year olds had an excuse. <laughs> and I said, wow, uh, you're amazing. So don't, and one last thing, since Christine mentioned your ordered ministers, and I guess ordered ministers are those who go to seminary and are ordained. Um, God has given you a lot of experiences that those ordered ministers haven't had. Secondly, some of those ordered ministers feel that because they've studied, they were religion major in college, and then they went to seminary and all, um, they have a false confidence in their ability to communicate the gospel that maybe you are not susceptible to. So rejoice. Uh, I remember years ago in a debate uh, some uh, but it was some uh, an ordered minister an ordained clergy person was saying uh, uh, you know the trouble is uh, some of you seminary professors uh, you need you need to be in the pulpit you, you need to have pastoral experience before you're in seminary uh, and your teaching would be better. And one of the seminary professors said, we have a better vantage point even than being in the pulpit. We sit in the pew. <laughs> we know what you're subjecting your people to Sunday after Sunday. <laughs> We're trying to work with that. So uh, I would urge you use the gifts that God has given you and um, one last thing, and that is, um, if you feel inadequate, if you wonder why me, if you're thinking about all the people who might be better at this at you, um, be careful. <laughs> Trust God to know what God was doing when God placed you in this situation. And uh, I, one of my seminarians, I was giving a hard time to for because she told me that though nothing would please her more than to have the paper that I had assigned at the first of the semester in on time that she had some work to do for some really important professors and so that my paper would be late at least a week I said to her you know your procrastination is just pathological and you you can't you can't be a, a pastor and get up on a Sunday morning and say, I wish I had a sermon for you, but it was one thing and then another. And so let's break up into discussion groups. Um, you And she said to me, hey, 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 uh, my procrastination is the least of my problems. Let me tell you. Uh, and if you got a problem with my being here preparing to be somebody's pastor, take it up with the Lord. I've already said to the Lord, this is nuts that I should be here. So uh, take it up with the Lord. Don't bother me with it. I agree with you. Well, anyway, so embrace your vocation. Thanks. By the way, some of you have had a lot more experience than I had in talking people into stuff. Like some of you may be in your lay life, you were, you were a salesperson, or maybe you were a teacher. So I'm just, yeah. Okay. Excuse me, Christine. That's good. I, I hope that that uh, was an, an encouragement to many of you as you, uh, as you struggle with your authority to, to preach. The uh, other struggle I find is, um, uh, a quote um, from your book in which you described preaching as a risky, high-wire, death-defying act of speaking for the God who has risked speech with us. And uh, in, later on, you 
ask, say that a question that could be asked of a uh, evaluating a sermon would be, why would anyone kill a preacher for this sermon? <laughs> and, uh, Maybe that's a high bar. I, I suspect that m many of us, uh, you, those who are here can correct me, but many of us didn't realize that that's what we were signing on for when we um, answered the call to, to be a preacher. Um, I know for myself, I was uh, in a congregation uh, the, of where the, the preacher was so elo eloquent that he could fill an 800 seat sanctuary um, in a small city um, every Sunday. Mm. And, um, and so when I w decided to go into preaching and talk to him about what, what was or into ministry and uh, talk to him about what that was involving, and he said, well, you know, preaching is about helping people fall in love with God and with the things of God. So that's what I thought I was doing when I went into preaching. And then when uh, I discovered that sometimes things that I said made people angry or upset or um, uh, distraught, um, I didn't, you know, I, I mean, that led to a lot of soul searching of saying, okay, is this really what I thought I was doing? Um, and how do I keep sustaining that kind of uh, ministry, that kind of preaching. So my question is, what is it that helps you sustain risky, uh, death-defying, high-wire preaching? <laughs> I, I, I don't know that many people would describe my preaching as in that way, even though I have said sometimes preaching can be that way. Um, what does it sustain? So I would say, I, I believe preaching should be biblical. I believe preachers should first go to scripture and, and be encountered by scripture and encounter scripture. Uh, I think we should go with curiosity saying, I wonder what the Lord is up to now, uh, in this text and through this text among us. And then I think it's my job to speak it as best as I receive it. Now I do that with the full knowledge that Jesus was rejected by many people who heard him preach. Uh, I noted to the students, Luke 4, uh, when Jesus is in his own hometown synagogue in Nazareth, Everything went well when he was reading the scripture. Uh, they all loved it. It was when he started preaching the scripture. Uh, that's when the trouble started. And generally, that's kind of the way it is. Uh, I think the, the, the trouble starts when we say things like, today this word is fulfilled in your hearing. Or, uh, thus saith the Lord. And um, I, I think we preachers, we preachers ought to pray for the courage to be able to say what we hear. And when people say, um, I was offended by that, or that hurt my feelings, or how dare you say that, or et cetera, you, you, I wouldn't advise saying this to them, but you can kind of say it to yourself. Yeah, Jesus had the same problem with people like you, um, saying that's what the, that's what they said to our Lord. Um, it, uh, but you you can maybe you can help people see that being a Christian involves coming and listening to a true and living God, whether that God says to you through preaching what you what you think you want to hear. Uh, I remember the, uh, I mentioned this in the book, but a woman that comes out of church one Sunday and says uh, to me as a preacher, I've had a hellish week. Uh, I And I said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, well, the boss is in town. I don't think the new boss likes me. And my son, my adult son, he's drinking again. And I said, I'm sorry. And she said, yeah, I, I came this morning seeking some comfort and consolation. 
And I said, well, I, I hope you found that today. And she said, not particularly. Uh, and then she said, I came here seeking comfort and consolation only to have God give me an assignment <laughs> and something related to one of the ministries of the church. And I thought that was wonderful that sometimes we come and we do receive comfort and consolation. And then sometimes we receive an assignment or sometimes I come seeking comfort and consolation only to have in some way or another, get the message, <laughs> you know, quit your complaining, even in your pain, I've called you to be a disciple. Now get out there and be a disciple. Uh, come on. Or uh, I've gathered you here at church this morning for you to feel somebody else's pain uh, more than your own or or all the complexity of messages uh, that that God is able to get through to God's people. And then uh, when people come out and if they say things like that was offensive or how dare you say that or I didn't like that sermon at all. You can say, uh, find a better way to say this than the way I'm saying it. I'm sure you can. But uh, to say, well, take it up with the Lord. You know, don't come whining back to me. Oh, this is hard. This isn't what I expected. I say, you know, I've got enough troubles as it is without having Jesus on my back, too. You, you, you can say, hey, I didn't call you to be a disciple. If I were calling disciples... I could have probably done a better job than Jesus has. Uh, I didn't call you to be a disciple. Don't come whining back to me. It's hard, you know, take it up with the Lord. You seem just as cowardly and self-deceitful as I am. But for reasons known only to the Lord, he thinks you can hear this. He thinks you can live this. So um, remember that for reasons known only to our Lord, he's assembled them to hear his word, and it's our job to try to speak it. I wish I had, uh, you had, uh, or that this this webinar had happened a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing to <laughs> Jeremiah. <laughs> oh, Jeremiah, yeah, Je yeah, I've, I've preached Jer with Jeremiah before, and one nice thing, you can come out and say, hey, 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 you know me. I'm a nice person. I've got the drapes hung in the parsonage. I don't want to move. Uh, this was Jeremiah today, not me. <laughs> I I wouldn't have said this to you. I, I, I would have been nice to you. But unfortunately, you're the one that came saying you wanted to hear a word from the Lord. And today is Jeremiah. And I remember someone coming out and saying of, an, of a sermon by my associate, uh, that was the most judgmental, negative sermon uh, we've heard recently. And I said, you know, I've worked with this woman for two years, and nothing about her is judgmental or negative. And I said, oh, 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 this, it's Matthew you're complaining about. This is year A of the lectionary. <laughs> it's Matthew you don't like. Um, good, fine. Yeah, this, this was not her. <laughs> she, she, you know, she's trying to speak for Matthew, and and yeah, but I, I and I, you know, part of the fun of being a preacher, part of the danger of being a preacher is, but part of fun too is we get to preach with Jeremiah, and maybe we by nature are are kind of easygoing and non-judgmental and nice and everything, and then you get Jeremiah saying. Eh, you call yourself God's people. You're the poorest excuse. Uh, I know how you treat the poor. I know how you do your business. Uh, uh, and is there not part of you that kind of enjoys speaking in a voice that is not exclusively yours? And, uh, well. Um. That's helpful. Yes. Now I, I've noticed that people are beginning to put some comments in the okay. uh, chat box. So even, I've got a couple more questions if we get a chance to get to them. Yeah. But 
rather have an opportunity for everybody else to contribute. Stephen, do you want to, uh, maybe Hurley, do you want to uh, pose your question? You've put it in the chat box, but if you can also uh, express it. And sure. And, and uh, you may have just touched on this, but I, I guess it's a struggle I have is in resting and, and, and sitting with scripture during the week in preparation for a sermon. How do you how do you manage that space between this is what I want to say and this is what maybe God is inspiring me to say and how do you know the difference? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I guess I pray, but but also say, uh, Lord, use me. Uh, uh, help me not to get in the way of what you want to say. Uh, and uh, I, I guess also to, you know, it's it's a custom in the liturgy I use. It, you We pray in epiclesis beforehand and we say, Lord, uh, take the reading of your word and the speaking of your word and get involved in it. <laughs> Come on, Holy Spirit. Uh, say more than I know how to say. Uh, say what you want to say, and uh, and 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 sometimes, uh, Stephen, I think it can also be kind of fun to share with the congregation. <laughs> I got a word for you today that I didn't want to say. Okay, hmm. um, or I've got a word today that I found difficult for me. Uh, you know, that uh, unfortunately it sounds today like Jesus is really criticizing rich people. And um, y'all know what kind of car I drive. <laughs> I'm one of the rich too. And I, so I stand under this word too. In fact, I think it's very helpful for preachers try to make clear that any judgment we're rendering to the congregation, it, it fell on us first. And and so that can be helpful. And uh, I, yeah, uh, I know I was preaching in a congregation recently. It was the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. <laughs> and I said to them, I really can't believe that your pastor invited me to preach this Sunday. And I know he didn't invite me until he read the appointed gospel for today. And I'm sorry that your pastor doesn't have the guts to preach this parable to you, but I have driven over from Durham to preach it to you. That's what we do. And here it goes. And um, I, I want all of you to know that I am a full professor at Duke University and I make probably as good a salary as anybody in this room. Now, <laughs> let's go with Jesus. <laughs> and I, you know, and Jesus talks about, there was a rich man, there was a poor man, and, and the rich man died and of course went straight to hell. And the poor man died, but he went to the bosom of Abraham. And, I said, uh, it, and the only way I could think of to kind of end my sermon are, I just admire your courage for showing up here week after week and listening to Jesus. Wow. Not everybody in this town would do it. Uh, well, anyway, <laughs> but. Yeah, uh, that's helpful. That's very helpful. I, I hope. Uh, it, it 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 I think Stephen, we work under this scandal that all the Protestant reformers at least agreed with, and that is the preached word is God's word. That's an outrageous claim when you think about my preaching. Um, and yet that's a claim. Today, when you hear that expression, God's word, normally it's used related to scripture. And yet, back in the Reformation, when you said God's word, normally you were talking about preaching of scripture, not scripture itself. In fact, some of the reformers taught 
it's not really God's word until somebody stands up and preaches it. So it, it's a scandal under which we work. Thank you. And Melody had a question as well. If Melody, do you want to uh, yeah. pose that? Yeah. Hi, yeah, I, I sometimes with wanting to skip passages, I don't always use the lectionary, but also notice that a lot of my colleagues just sometimes ignore <clears throat> splash of scripture because they don't feel comfortable with it. I noticed that the lectionary leaves out some interesting passages. <laughs> interesting observation, Melody. Uh, I remember Elizabeth Ockemeyer, who was a, a friend and a, a great teacher of the Old Testament, said, uh, went through the lectionary and said, uh, the lectionary committee must have been the most squeamish people trying to protect us from God. <laughs> and she noted all the things left out, or the passages that you're reading along the passage, and then suddenly things get difficult, and they just skip over it and go right on. the So, um, yeah, I'm, one is probably ought to admit, mea culpa, I'm guilty of having scripture that better aligns with my kind of uh, my theology or my sensitivities. Uh, I do think, Melody, uh, you can, by the way, what you've just said can be a wonderful hook uh, for a, the beginning of a sermon <laughs> is to say to them, I want everybody to know I would not have preached this scripture on my own. Uh, <clears throat> I want, I remember Fred Craddock great teacher of preachers, beginning a sermon by saying, this year I shall celebrate the 32nd anniversary of my attempt to get rid of this passage of scripture. And then he began a sermon on Ecclesiastes. And he said, I, I first met it in high school. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And it, I liked it. It, and it said, yeah, hey, hey, kids, as you're graduating from high school, remember your creator while you're remembering everything else. He said, then in college, I read Ecclesiastes. It's horrible. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, because when you get older, you're going to hate God. Because God will rip off everything you've got that makes your life fun and enjoyable. And uh, anyway, it was a marvelous entry into the passage. So I think you can share some of that with people. And then you can, uh, we had a great discussion in class this week about uh, Hagar and that story of Hagar and this horrible abuse in this family of Abraham and Sarah and the way this woman is treated and her child and a woman was saying, how can I possibly uh, preach this text in a congregation? And um, one of the, an Old Testament professor was responding and said, uh, well, I don't think it should be preached unless you've got a congregation in which there are people who have suffered domestic abuse. They might find it helpful to know the Bible talks about what has been difficult in your life. Or maybe in your congregation, there are families that are as screwed up as Abraham's family. And maybe it will be comforting to them to know that somehow God used even these scoundrels, Abraham and Sarah, to birth God's people Israel. I mean, you know, anyway, it was, so sometimes that works. Uh, and while well, I'm out there, there is scripture. I, I'm now a visiting preacher wherever I am. I'm coming up to Timothy Eaton Church uh, in Toronto in December to install a former student of mine, Jason Biasey, uh, there in, in that congregation. But um, 
there is some scripture that that I find difficult to preach as a visiting preacher. For Jesus, a few weeks ago, uh, came up Jesus on divorce <laughs> and marriage after divorce. And I thought, it's odd, when I was a pastor, I always preached on that text because it was on people's minds. And I thought, they, here's, hey, hey, church, here's how to think about this. Uh, here's how I think about it. Uh, well, I thought, I'm reluctant to preach on that text when I'm not their pastor, when I'm not there to say, uh, oh, that sermon was difficult for you. Okay, let's talk about it over Coffee Monday. So there can be scripture that can be skipped, maybe. <laughs> I think that's, that's helpful, especially because many of the lay preachers are not in the same congregation, you know, week after oh, week. Oh, good point. You're, you're all the visiting firemen too, like me. Yeah, blow in, blow off, and then blow out uh, of town. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And Sandra, you had a question to ask. Uh, you're on mute still. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not an ordained minister, and perhaps this has been uh, covered had I been. My concern is with world events, and I, um, I'm i pulpit supply as a licensed lay worship leader. My concern is I will have prepared that Sunday with, elect with lectionary readings, and on the Saturday night, we've entered into possibly World War III. Mm. What would I do? I'm I'm only there that Sunday, and I can't ignore it. I can't. I uh, if it was such a huge event, I don't think I could only include that at, towards the end in prayers of the people. Um, I'd be praying a lot before I went in uh, for for God to give me great inspiration. Um, that's something that. I've been thinking about recently when I yeah. when I follow world events. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Robert had um, a really a good suggestion uh, for me, um, but my idea was th this is a big event that mm -hmm. can't be ignored um, or covered with only within the prayers of the people. Any suggestions? Um, I, I think it's it's great for you to think that preaching has a responsibility to speak to events. Um, so that that that's good that you worry about that. Uh, I, I think part of our challenge is uh, one: uh, what is what is an event? Uh, Lord, you used uh, World War III that I'm still stuck thinking about. Probably the last thing I would do uh, on the first day of World War III is <laughs> probably get up and uh, worry about But, but uh, uh, you know, what is an event? And, and what does the Christian faith, what does Scripture have to say to that event? There's some events that occur that are noteworthy, important events, but it's kind of hard for me to know exactly where our faith aligns with that event. I'm thinking, you know, during 9-11, uh, when, when we had our event, uh, it, it, I driving back to town thinking about, what am I gonna preach on Sunday? Well, I'm not gonna preach what I thought I was gonna preach. But what do I preach? And I, I remember that being a time when I threw out the sermon I'd prepared and prepared another sermon as best I could. However, um, what do you preach? Uh, there were preachers who preached on that day. America is innocent. We have been attacked by these evil people. And now we have got to respond in kind and wipe out this evil from the world. Uh, I didn't want to preach that. 
I, I, I didn't want to unleash my anger at George Bush um, and all. Um, what, what did I? Anyway, I ended up preaching from Genesis 1. Uh, in the beginning, God said. And my sermon was an affirmation that God is creator and continues to create even in our darkness, even in our confusion and mess. Don't know if that sermon was the sermon that should have been preached. So I, I think you can change. I know, um, uh, well, anyway, I, 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 gosh, I, I just, I don't have an easy response to that. I would just encourage you to pray and be led. And I think it can be very effective when a preacher, I know, for instance, after a horrible racial killing in a town in South Carolina, uh, one of my students mounted the pulpit and said, I have a sermon today, and the sermon was going to be on uh, love, and the need to welcome all people, and uh, it just feels like garbage <laughs> right now uh, in the face of this horrible evil. And I don't know what to say. Um, so I'm going to have to let Paul try to help us. And he read from Romans 8. I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And he said, uh, uh, and I'm going to now invite you to prayer <laughs> and to join me in prayer. So that that was an occasion when the preacher sort of didn't know what to say and and the preacher's own silence became a kind of sermon in itself so maybe that god can use that too well thank you um i know within my studies i've been it's been drilled into me not to bring politics in uh, um to the pulpit oh um i'd like to see you do that i, mean, <laughs> so I, I don't know be, anyway <laughs> it would yeah. not be as it would not be a time for me to yeah. be saying uh, us versus them i i would yeah. want yeah. it something that i could comfort yeah and and give some hmm some I, uh, abilities. It, it's it's hard for me to appear before you today i my confidence was kind of knocked out from under me because thinking, oh, Lord, these are Canadians. And um, a, a few years ago, I was at the cathedral, Episcopal uh, Anglican Cathedral in Vancouver. And a layperson afterwards said, uh, are you going to really elect that thief, that scoundrel, Donald Trump, to be president? And I said, is that what your preacher is telling you here in Canada? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You think we're crazy? Of course we're not going to elect that fool. No. Anyway, about four months later, after we elected him president, the dean of the cathedral wrote me and says, don't you want to come back to Vancouver and apologize for our people that you said were ridiculous for thinking you would do this? <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I'm 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 kind of worried today that many of you are looking at me thinking, gee, he's giving us advice and he is, uh, uh, anyway, so, but thank you for not bringing up such unpleasantness. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there other questions that people have? You know, after that last comment about politics, I, I would just say that I think it's impossible for me to say much of anything that could not have kind of political significance. I think it's important that sermons come from the word, of, come from the scripture, but it's important they need to touch down where we live in the world. Yeah, that's part of preaching too. At, at the same time, I think the anything I say that's explicitly political it's finally got the answer to God's word and not, uh, oh, is he to the left or is he to the right? But is, is are my political concerns that I'm using pulpit time 
to talk about. Are those concerns that uh, are are justified through this, the preaching through the scripture? And I think that helps uh, in talking about politics. Uh, but I I do think sometimes uh, sometimes the greatest thing we can do for our people is maybe to remind them that politics is not God and that the modern democratic nation state is not salvation, <laughs> that God is greater even than our most noble political aspirations. And sometimes that's important. I, I did a book of sermons by campus pastors that were preached on the Sunday after the 9-11 uh, tragedy. And um, most pastors really tried to speak some word, as I did, uh, to their congregations in the midst of this. But there were also pastors who said, we've been through a national trauma. Um, by the way, we're nobody special. Uh, a lot of nations, a lot of peoples go through trauma. And I am now going to read a passage from Lamentations <laughs> and talk about when Israel went through a trauma. And I, I thought it was kind of, it was sort of, uh, it was refreshing to hear someone say, scripture sometimes reminds us that our political current event preoccupations are not the whole story of, of our life with God at the moment. And sometimes we come to church to get delivered from some of those preoccupations. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And Kate, you had a question. We've got time for the for one more. So good. I'm just interested if you could give us some insight into the use of uh, humor in sermons and preaching. Well, Kate, you should never use humor in your preaching. Um, <laughs> I see you're not taking that statement seriously. Um, <laughs> uh, I think humor, it, one is I think Aristotle was right. Uh, humor is, is a form of aggression. <laughs> you know, all humor tends to be painful to somebody. It's in all. Um, and maybe to admit that, uh, I'll have people say, well, I think humor is fine as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And I said, well, name me something that's funny that isn't painful to somebody who's the brunt of the humor. I, I, I think humor is most wonderful and most appropriate when it appears to kind of arise in from the biblical text. I remember in the congregation saying that uh, from John's gospel, uh, Jesus comes along, a man who's been lying at a pool for 38 years, uh, waiting for an angel to come, you know, for the waters to be ruffled so he could come to the healing waters. Jesus comes by, he looks at the man and says, hi, would you like to be healed? And I said, this isn't in our Bibles, but I'm sure it was, it was there originally. The man said, well, you know, lying here for 38 darn years... It has occurred to me that would be not, what kind of stupid question is that? Uh, you know, in the fun, uh, I, so I think there is that holy humor that I think occurs from realizing God is God and we're not. There's a great space between us, particularly, well, I got to preach this weekend on Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And just imagine what it was like to tell that parable to a group of righteous people gathered to hear this rabbi's interpretation of God's word and to talk about two people that worship, one, a horrible person, the other, a very good person in every sense of the word. And yet one comes back home getting nothing out of worship unjustified. The other comes home justified. Ooh, the worst person. You, you know, wow. And 
I'm thinking, I got to say that to people who've gotten dressed and come down here to church. And, and Jesus is, is ridiculing them in their piety. Are you crazy? Um, so I, I, I think that's humor that's interesting. And uh, uh, yeah, and but be careful. I've never been criticized for being too serious in a sermon, Kate. Uh, and uh, yeah. I found it very helpful to realize that many passages are Jesus is having fun with the people. Kidding. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, to say, uh, blessed are you uh, who are poor um, in spirit. And somebody says, well, hey, hey, to be poor is to be poor in spirit. That kind of goes with power. Or uh, blessed are you who are unemployed. Oh, how fortunate are those of you who've just gone through a nasty divorce. Uh, and the congregation says, are you, what? No, that's to be cursed. That's not to be blessed. And then Jesus says, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wasn't talking about the American way. I'm talking about the kingdom of God here, people. Uh, it's it's upside down. It is flipped from the way you live. Um, uh, or when Jesus uh, looks at this earnest person who says, what do I got to do to get in on your eternal life and your good stuff? And he says, well, um, you know, hey, obey all the commandments. Um, get out of here. Just obey all the commandments. And this guy says, oh, I've obeyed all the commandments. I've never broken a commandment my whole life. And then Mark says he looked at him and loved him and says, you know, just, just, I don't, this only place in any of the gospels I've ever been reported to love an individual. And, um, but since I love you so much, uh, let me just have you do one little thing for me. Go sell everything you've got, give it to the poor. Then you can follow me because I love you. you know? And the guy got depressed and left. Well, there is humor in that surely. Uh, and, 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 Maybe it's the kind of humor that is holy because it it we start to see ourselves honestly. Uh, you know, maybe that's why my wife and I do not listen to any news now except on Stephen Colbert. Uh, and we sort of think, gosh, in these times, maybe the the greatest truth is that which is delivered by comedians. Uh, look at us. So, well, thank you so much for your uh, the time today and the insights that you've offered, and thank you to all uh, all of you who've gathered too, and the questions that you asked, um, very helpful. Um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, Janice has put in there. I've always imagined Jonah to be a fabulous stand-up comic. That's great. Although Janice, you misspelled humor. Uh, there. Uh, but <laughs> no. uh, thank you. I've enjoyed being with you. And, and thank you for being willing to risk preaching with Jesus. Uh, it's, it can be risky work, but I can say after five decades of working with Jesus, uh, it, it can be uh, also a, a great way to go. So thank you all for inviting me to be part of it. Great. Thank you.